friends, this is the second week of Advent. If you have a wreath at home or if you worship with us in person, this week we light the candle of peace. This candle helps us remember that the season of Advent isn't about how much we can do or buy, but it's about finding moments of quiet to remember that Jesus is our peace. Fittingly, our scripture passage today reminds us that even when the world seems dark and hopeless, Jesus is our light and can give us a peace that passes understanding. As we get started today, I'd like to pray and ask the Holy Spirit to illuminate our time together. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the gift of your Son, Jesus Christ, the light of the world. We thank you for the scripture that records the very origins of our faith all the way to the promise that one day Jesus will come again to the earth. We pray that today you will open our hearts and minds to hear your truth and let us allow that truth to become a radical change in our lives. I pray this in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. I don't know about you, but this time of year always makes me a little bit nostalgic. I tend to reflect on the past year and the important moments I want to remember. This year, I found myself thinking about our year-long study through the Bible and how much I've enjoyed learning and growing together. Some of my favorite weeks were from the Old Testament stories that I've been able to preach, like Rahab and Ruth, and I hope that they've been a blessing to you as much as they have been to me. Now, when I preach a sermon, one of the questions I always try to answer is, so what? I never want to leave you thinking, okay, cool, but what does that have to do with me? The same is true for our series, Foundations 365. Yes, it's been awesome, but why was it so important? Now, while we don't think of the Old Testament as exactly a historical document, we know that the stories we've read were formative in the faith of Jesus. He and the apostles studied them from an early age and probably memorized large passages of scripture. The passage we will read from today from the book of Hebrews, reminds us how important the stories of the Old Testament were to the faith and the formation of the writers of the New Testament. Even now, 2,000 years later, I believe it's important for us to read and learn these stories, and I hope that if nothing else over the past year, you've been able to see how all of Scripture, the entire biblical narrative, is one unified story that points us to Jesus' ministry and resurrection. Ultimately, we look for the day when Christ will come again to rule and reign on the earth. Before we dive into today's passage, I want to provide a little context. The book of Hebrews was originally addressed to a group of early Jewish converts to Christianity. They were located in a large city governed by the Roman Empire. The culture was very Hellenistic, and it would have been a difficult place for Christians to thrive. Just like the apostles, they were heavily persecuted by the Romans for worshiping Jesus as king rather than Caesar. The authorship of Hebrews is unknown. Traditionally, the book was thought to have been written by Paul, but scholars have come to some consensus that the writing style is too different. However, it is widely believed that it was written by someone who studied under Paul, so we say it's a Pauline document. Hebrews isn't exactly a letter, it's more like an extended sermon, and it's meant to encourage these persecuted Christians to continue in their faith. Uh, Interestingly, I preached on Hebrews chapter 11, verse 29 through 12, 2 in August of 2022 as part of our Discipleship 101 series. It was interesting to go back and see how I've grown in my biblical studies and also in preaching style. It's also neat to see how God gives us completely different messages to share at different times and in different contexts. The last few verses of Hebrews 11 list several stories with infamous heroines and heroes from the Jewish Bible. The author references the Red Sea, Jericho, Rahab, Gideon, Barak, Samson, David, and Samuel all within four verses. Many of these people we've studied over the past year. The writer reminds the reader of the accomplishments of these Hebrew heroes. He says, Through faith they conquered kingdoms, administered justice, obtained promises, shut the mouths of lions, quenched the power of fire, escaped the edge of the sword, were made strong out of weakness, became mighty in war, put foreign and armies to flight. Women received their dead by resurrection. Others were tortured, refusing to accept release in order to obtain a better resurrection. 
Others suffered mocking and flogging and even chains and imprisonment. They were stoned to death. They were sawn in two. They were killed by the sword. They went about in skins of sheep and goats, destitute, persecuted, tormented, of whom the world was not worthy. They wandered in deserts and mountains and in caves and holes in the ground. Yikes, that sounds terrible. It's an excellent reminder to us that throughout Scripture, both in the Old Testament and the New, people were willing to suffer and die for their faith. The writer then goes on in chapter 12 to use these examples to encourage the persecuted Hebrews to stand in solidarity with the forerunners in their faith, and then reminds them that Jesus was the ultimate culmination of the list of heroes. So friends, let's continue reading from Hebrews chapter 12, verses 1 through 13. Therefore, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us also lay aside every weight and the sin that clings so closely. And let us run with perseverance the race that is set before us, looking to Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of faith, who for the sake of joy that was set before him endured the cross, disregarding its shame and has taken his seat at the right hand of the throne of God. Consider him who endured such hostility against himself from sinners so that you may not grow weary in your souls or lose heart. In your struggle against sin, you have not yet resisted to the point of shedding your blood. And you have forgotten the exhortation that addresses you as children. My child, do not regard lightly the discipline of the Lord or lose heart when you are punished by him. For the Lord disciplines those whom he loves and chastises every child whom he accepts. Endure trials for the sake of discipline. God is treating you as children. For what child is there whom a parent does not discipline? If you do not have that discipline in which all children share, then you are illegitimate and not his children. Moreover, we had human parents to discipline us and we respected them. Should we not be even more willing to be subject to the father of spirits and live? For they disciplined us for a short time as seemed best to them, but he disciplines us for our good, in order that we may share his holiness. Now, discipline always seems painful rather than pleasant at the time, but later it yields the peaceful fruit of righteousness to those who have been trained by it. Therefore, lift your drooping hands and strengthen your weak knees and make straight paths for your feet, so that what is lame may not be put out of joint, but rather be healed. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The last two weeks, our scripture passages have had a really important word in them. Therefore, last week and the week before, Pastor John and I reminded you that when you're reading your Bible and you see therefore, you should stop and ask yourself, what's the therefore, therefore? Context is key when we study the Bible. When we look at this passage in combination with the previous chapter about the Hebrew ancestors, we can see how the two ideas flow together. The heroes of our faith endured all kinds of things in pursuit of God, mocking, beatings, rape, death, and all of it was considered an honor in service of Yahweh. These men and women are now part of what the author calls a great cloud of witnesses. The Hebrew writer is a master of metaphor and here compares the Christian life to a race. At this athletic event or track meet, there's a cloud of people who are spectators or witnesses. They now gather around us, the ones who are still running the race, and their presence has a strong positive impact on the runners. They're cheering us on, giving us encouragement and courage and faith to continue in the race. The author says that we have to run with perseverance, looking to Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of our faith. The phrase, looking to Jesus, could instead be translated as looking away to. So when running the race, we should look away from everyone and everything else that causes a distraction and concentrate singularly on Jesus as our goal. I don't know about you, but I find that incredibly difficult sometimes. I live, breathe, work, eat, and sleep with the church on my mind, and even still I have to stop and remind myself why I do the things I do. I want to make this church as great as it can be. I want new families to come here. I want our kids' ministry to grow. I have huge ideas and dreams for our facility, and it's so easy to get caught up in doing those things so that I can say, look what I did for God. 
But that's not the point of the race. We're to keep Jesus firmly in our sight because he is the pioneer and perfecter of the faith. Not only is he the source and object of our worship, but also the perfect example of how we should live out our faith, even amidst suffering and extreme persecution. The Hebrew forerunners of the faith also endured persecution, but Christ is the perfect example of how enduring hostility can be done in pursuit of a goal. Scripture says that he suffered for the prospect of future joy. Jesus endured a horrific and shameful experience on the cross and now, as a result, sits enthroned at the right hand of the Father. The author goes on in the following verses to compare the trials they're facing to the discipline a parent gives to a child. In our modern context, discipline often carries negative connotations, but in the wisdom tradition of the Hebrews, discipline was formative and instructional, and it was a key part of the parent-child relationship. By applying this text to the readers, the writer is saying they are the children of God. Suffering is an assurance of the Father's love and a promise that we too will one day participate in Christ's triumph over death. For Christians, the reward or the prize doesn't just come at the end of the race. We've already won. We're living in the ultimate prize of eternal life with God. The point is that it's not all about getting to the end. It's how we run the race of life, how we further God's mission in the world while we're here. Our Advent devotionals this year are a great reminder that this season isn't just about waiting for Christmas and the birth of Christ. It's also about waiting for Christ to come again. Sometimes I find it incredibly difficult to keep running in this crazy world around us. I see the suffering of God's people everywhere, the abuse of God's beautiful creation, the moral conditions of our society, and I find myself longing for the end. I long for the day when all those tears are wiped away and we can fully experience God reign and rule on this world. And yet the author tells us that we're called to persevere through the pain and the hardship and participate in God's love in our world. It's about how we live in the in-between time. This would have been an important concept for the original readers of Hebrews. They were a congregation that was stumbling and faltering with some on the verge of dropping out altogether. The author encourages them to stay the course and persevere. And I also need to hear that encouragement today. Maybe you do too. So friend, let me remind you, in this race of life, you are not alone. You're not the only runner. The rest of us are here with you, running alongside you, enduring the same struggles of life. Not only that, but we have a great cloud of witnesses who have run before us and completed the race of faith. I find that to be incredibly encouraging. I think about people like Rahab and Ruth, David, Peter, Paul, even people like Dr. Martin Luther King and Fannie Lou Hamer, people who used to sit in our pews on Sundays. All of them have run the race before us and are cheering us on. And as we run the race, we can look away from everything else that distracts us and look to Jesus to help us persevere. We can do this until our weary world rejoices and God's kingdom come and God's will is done here on earth as it is in heaven. Amen. Thank you.